Flash floods and tornado watches are in effect. A devastating forest fire. Life-threatening storm surge. Excessive snow melt. A monster winter storm. Record breaking heat. A bomb cyclone. This deadly hurricane. This looks like a horror film. The U.S. has ambitious goals to meet on climate change. And we've set aside the money. $369 billion. But money is the easy part. Clean energy is moving faster than ever before. And depending on your math, we're probably going about 30% as fast as we need to go right now to achieve anything that looks like a zero carbon, non-carbon, net zero, anything by mid-century. Is it even possible? Semaphore gathered lawmakers, industry leaders, and environmentalists together in D.C. to tackle this very question. Congress just loosened restrictions for the first time in 40 years, which could speed things up. But Texas is already living in that future. I was like, this here is a windmill site. And this right here is also a windmill site. It's building clean energy faster than anywhere else. Yeah, I think it's surprising too. Texas is number one in wind. And we're getting close to the top solar capacity. The traditionally conservative state is leading the way for renewable energy across the nation. And it's running into problems faster than anywhere else, too. I feel like we're going to be Houston's junkyard. Common thread in much of the nine-bill package announced Thursday he's reducing support for renewable energy resources. Governor Abbott now, who says renewable energy will be excluded from a new economic incentive program. Our county is under assault. What's going to happen with wildlife? As far as transmission, um, we're a bit of a basket case, actually. The state sees itself as one of the first ones facing this problem, and I think people will be watching to see how that plays out here. But if Texas shows us anything, it's that we're speeding towards a cliff, and we didn't build a bridge. This is the American dream, an automotive age, traveling on time-saving superhighways. The clean energy push today mirrors the country's push for an interstate highway system in the 1950s. Like the old road system, the current electric grid is a patchwork of regional webs. But unlike the highway project, getting approval to build happens state by state, locality by locality. Producing the American energy that we need and the world needs is nearly impossible with our current permitting system. Our federal permitting process moves in slow motion, too often no motion at all. Permitting. It's everything that has to happen before a project breaks ground. Byzantine steps that you have to go through. If we think about building renewable energy, like transporting cars around the country, there's a few moving parts. In this century, America has become a nation on wheels. First, you need to manufacture the car. That is, build enough wind and solar farms to generate enough clean energy. Getting to net zero emissions by 2050 would require tripling our renewable energy generation. Doing that requires approvals from every level, local, state, federal. On average, it takes about four and a half years to get uh, permitting done before you even break ground. Wildlife permits, land use reviews. I was just reading about a, you know, a project in San Francisco where they were looking at the, the certain shade angle of a building and where that was going to, to fall. So it takes a while. There's a pretty clear reason Texas leaped ahead. And that story starts in the late 90s. When George Bush was governor and they deregulated the Texas market in 1999, Thank you all basically they, they made a big change to break apart the utility like monopoly system for how energy is produced and sold. The deregulation law I signed in Texas requires the production of 2,000 megawatts of new renewable energy by the year 2009. Texas will soon be the largest market for renewable energy in America. And it's surpassed the goals many times over at this point. Of course, Texas' unusually deregulated energy system has its faults. More than 620,000 waking up without power in Texas this morning. Every source of power that the state of Texas has has been compromised. Today, the Department of Health upped the state's death toll to 111. In 2021, extreme cold from winter storm Yuri crippled the state's power grid, 
To me, that was actually a failure of, of, of regulation. And this summer, extreme heat is pushing it back to its limit, while the state deals with record high energy demand to keep homes cool. And it is so hot, both ERCOT and the Public Utility Commission of Texas are asking us to conserve energy. But for all of its faults, you can't say that lack of speed is one of them. The solar power and battery storage that Texas has been putting on the grid has kept it from losing power during the heat wave. It's a pretty seamless process for developers. There's not a lot of permitting. The next step is registering your car so you can put it on the road. Or plug your winter solar farm into the electric grid. And just like at the DMV, right now there are hundreds of clean energy projects waiting in a line called the interconnection queue. These things are just sort of coming at this rapid speed that is totally unprecedented. And the grid system is not really prepared to, to handle that. And there's a lot of dispute about who should actually pay the cost of interconnection. Is it whoever comes first? Is it, you know, who has the bigger project? Texas isn't that far ahead on this front, but it's still doing better than most of the rest of the country. You know, in Texas, we're, there, there's a bit of a backlog, but nothing like that. This map shows the percentage of projects that request interconnection and actually get built. The numbers are pretty low across the board, with the Northeast region hitting the highest rates of completion at 38%. Texas sits just behind at 31 percent. We're running out of roads. We didn't dream big enough. Finally, you need to build the roads and bridges, or get power from places where it's generated to the places where people live and work. Renewable energy isn't like oil or gas, where the power plants are close to cities, which is where these transmission lines come into play. There needs to be way more of them, and they need to be way longer. We need to build 200,000 miles of transmission lines. 200,000 200, miles, you know, the United States is, you know, like yeah. 2,500 right. miles wide. Yeah. So you've got to go back and forth that many times. The rate at which we're building now is 1,800 a year. In other words, we need to double the size of the grid in just over a decade. Otherwise, it would be like sending a bunch of cars off a cliff because we didn't build a bridge. If we don't speed things up, we will fail. Without doubling the grid, researchers say that 80% of the environmental benefits of electrification will be wasted. This is where even Texas doesn't have an answer. We're still in that situation where transmission is a major um, bottleneck. Basically, when solar or gas is not able to move along the lines and get to the load centers where it's needed. But it's not just a Texas problem. It's not even a U.S. problem. It's a global problem. I just had a meeting yesterday with the Chinese minister they have the same uh, or similar problem. Europe has a similar problem. Uh, the United States has a similar problem. Japan, when it comes to Greece, everybody's more or less in a difficult situation. So it's a major undertaking, even if everyone's on the same page, but they're not. One, we don't need to issue any new permits for fossils. We can't run this country without the horsepower of clean fossil. The main disagreement in Washington isn't about whether we need this kind of permitting reform. There were a few. It's if that reform should be limited to renewables only. Senator Joe Manchin has been pushing for permitting reform for years. He finally got a win in the debt ceiling bill, with a provision that would limit federal environmental reviews to two years. But in doing so, he also struck a deal to approve the contentious Mountain Valley oil pipeline and shield it from legal challenges. But even if they do find an answer, there's another problem coming right after. In Texas, the speed at which it's building renewables has come with its own set of problems, pitting people who say they care about the environment against each other. On one hand, there are environmentalists who think we need to deploy clean energy at all costs to avoid a climate catastrophe. On the other, conservationists worry that clean energy will destroy landscapes and wildlife. This is one of the really kind of difficult tensions of the energy transition is that it requires building a lot of stuff. We have to put steel in the ground at a massive scale, and there are inevitably going to be conflicts with that. As we're building all of this infrastructure, transmission lines, solar farms, all this stuff, in some cases, those things are going to pass through someone's backyard. I don't know anyone that like grows up and is like, I want to build my dream home right in the middle of the wind farm. You can just see, like even in the distance, all the white glittering panels here. 
at one point in time, there was acres of cotton and corn or row crop production, and now it's got sticks out on the ground. <laughs> Probably 80% of the cars that pass us are linked to construction. Krisha lives in much of rural America's future, in El Campo, a community about an hour southwest of Houston. Over the past few years, she's watched as more and more of the land around her home has been cleared for wind and solar projects. My dad is a agricultural aviator. Some people refer to that as crop dusting. I am a fourth generation pilot, the first female in our family to fly. This is his work environment. You know, um, it's coming after his direct form of living and the safety precautions that they have to sur surround themselves with every single day. At one point in time when they were gonna put a windmill literally off of the end of our airstrip, like half a mile. I mean, right now, if we have an engine failure, you're gonna land in the grass or maybe by a tree, which is still not ideal where you wanna land at, but it's, I'd rather probably land there than I would on a metal pole or trying to navigate around a 700 foot obstacle that's turning in a circle. There's very little oversight even from the FAA. When we reached out to them, which they do like an aeronautical study, and we sent in our comments and our concerns. The FAA wouldn't stop the wind turbines construction, and Krisha had to go directly to the developers themselves who scrapped the project. But again, not even they could stop these projects from being done. If the goal is more renewable energy, I don't think anybody's for say against that. I think it's just a matter of how it's done. Krisha was part of a movement in Texas this legislative session to restrict renewable energy development even driving to the Capitol to speak out in support of a Texas bill that would add more regulations to wind and solar, making it much harder to build. We talk about the jobs that are brought. Nobody talks about the jobs that are lost. You know, there's crop consultants, there's seed production, there's technology that's gone towards that. So it's this question of how do you move forward with responsible development, like recognizing that renewable energy has to be part of the equation, but also taking into account this pushback that rural communities seem to be like really getting behind that's related to protecting the land. And while the worst of the anti-renewables bills didn't pass in Texas, we're starting to see more and more pushback against clean energy across the country as locals fight back. Four and five years you've gone through all of the agencies and lo and behold, as soon as you think you're ready to go, you get taken to court. There's always a group that wants to sue, and then they do. Even if we speed up the federal review process, there are still 228 local restrictions across 35 states and nine statewide laws to block clean energy projects. If in any honest way you look at the speed and scale of what we need to accomplish, it's horrifying. And part of that goal is figuring out how to weigh local pain with the national good. A lot of times people don't live in communities like ours to realize what we're losing. I feel like there is something to be protected in, in rural America. The remarkable, wacky thing about this country is that we elect members locally, yet they have to serve the national interest. It's really a question about who gets to decide. When we say permitting reform, we no, I don't think anyone wants to see a sort of Wild West situation where any project developer can just build whatever they want anytime with no review. In order to achieve our environmental goals, we have to build things. And the outline of what we're discussing here today, it seems to me, is pretty clear. Deadlines, some limitation on the length of time that litigation takes, not to deny people their voice, but to be sure that they speak up in a timely way. You can do it in two years. And you can do it in two years without transgressing on good process while making it possible for states and localities and tribes and communities to be part of that process. I have been covering climate change now for more than a decade from all over the world. And, you know, I, I can tell you that the situation for people who are on the front line of climate change is extremely dire and life-threatening. Right now, we've built only half of the roads that we need. And if we're going to meet our climate goals, lawmakers are going to have to make decisions that could potentially create a huge backlash. So hopefully we can do that in a way that protects people's rights, protect the environment, but we are gonna have to build this up. That, that is unavoidable. Now there is another payment to be made on our freedom of movement. It's the price for growing greater than our biggest dreams.